Good evening, I'm Mike Traugott. I'm the director of the ICPSR summer program. I wanna welcome you to uh, another, actually the last in our series of Blaylock lectures uh, as part of the 2020 summer program. These lectures are held uh, to honor Hubert Tad Blaylock, who was a sociologist, a statistician who also studied social relations. He was an official representative to the consortium from the University of Washington, and he also served on the ICPSR Council. We have had um, a variety of lectures that uh, were part of a, a thread or topical uh, thread during the Blaylock lectures. One of them uh, has been related to data stewardship. And tonight we're having the last in the series that's related to that particular topic. The title of the talk is What Difference Does Curation Make? Introducing MICA, Measuring the Impacts of Curatorial Actions Project. <clears throat> and the lecture is being presented by a colleague in ICPSR, uh, Libby Hemphill. Libby uh, studies data curation, especially how we evaluate the impacts of data reuse and investments in curating and disseminating research data. She also studies political discussions in social media to understand how they impact political outcomes and how we can address toxicity online. Libby is a director of the Resource Center for Minority Data at ICPSR and an associate professor in the School of Information. Her work has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, the Nayer Prize, Mozilla, the Anti-Defamation League, Amazon, and Discovered Text. We're very pleased to have Libby with us this evening. And now I'm going to turn the screen over to her. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll try not to get too nervous about being the final lecture, but it feels appropriate that we're going to talk about a project that's happening at ICPSR uh, that is about digital curation. Um, I do have both the Q&A window and the chat window open, and my hope is that I can answer questions as they come in if that's okay with you all. So don't hold them, go ahead, send them in. Uh, I'm happy to be interrupted. Um, and I think if I click this, it might get started. Whoa. There we go. Okay, so you all are much more familiar with ICPSR than many of the other audiences who we talked to Micah about, but I'm not sure how familiar you are with parts of ICPSR aside from the summer program. Um, so especially I want to talk about the data that we hold at ICPSR and our focus is on social and behavioral science data, sort of broadly defined, that if it's data that would be of use to researchers in the social and behavioral sciences, then we are interested in it. Uh, we have roughly 10,000 studies that have 250,000 files. Why is files bigger? Uh, it could be things like the question text for a survey or additional information about the how the study was collected or a paper about the data uh, or that leveraged the data. Uh, roughly 1,500 of those are restricted studies, which means that there are some additional criteria that people need to meet in order to work with the data in order to protect the confidentiality of the folks who are represented in the data. Uh, one of my favorite features of ICPSR and something that sets us apart from our peers is the bibliography of data related literature. Uh, which is when you visit studies at ICPSR or when you search our website, you can find papers and other types of publications that leverage the data that's included in our collections. These are especially useful for understanding how one might use the data to build understanding of a new research question. You can use them in teaching. Uh, it helps you build as a researcher on existing literature in a space, uh, and it makes it easier to find data that people are often looking for papers and then they that's how they end up finding the data where we're not necessarily used to looking for data first. Um, and we have about 60,000 active users. This is 
before the summer program started. So I would assume that that number is now higher because every year in the summer it goes up as we get more people um, familiar with our resources. Uh, and I'd like to play a little video about what data curation is and what that means so that the rest of the talk makes sense. So we'll see what happens if I play it. There we go. So I use the video to introduce the activities of curation. So often we sort of like if you think about oh, go ahead. I'll wait for it. Um, that any of the work that goes into making data findable. So the addition of metadata, the attachment of question text, some discussion of or some addition of like a description of how the data was collected. Uh, these are all parts of the curation process and much of what I think of as ICPSR's special sauce that we make sure the data is findable and reusable by going through this process. And what Micah is, and Mike, I see your question and I will answer it, but not in this moment. Uh, so what is the Micah project? Um, the goal of the Micah project is to develop curatorial metrics, so ways that we can measure to evaluate the impact and efficacy of specific data curation processes. So what does this mean in plain speak? This is how do we know which parts of curation matter for reuse? Um, and what it means for MICA uh, is that we wanna understand both when are these actions taken and what impact do they have on different types of reuse where even how do we measure reuse is a question that there are many different ways to measure it, whether we're looking at downloads or whether someone uses it in teaching or did someone publish a paper that references the data. Uh, was it used in a grant proposal. Um, there are lots of different ways in which to characterize reuse um, and there are many different ways to characterize what are curation activities and our goal in the MICA project is to understand the relationship between all those different types of reuse and the effort that we as an organization and that principal investigators and their teams put into preparing data for others to use it. I ended up on the wrong window. We have two main funders for the MICA project. Um, one is the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the other is the National Science Foundation and we're funded <clears throat> through the Social and Behavioral and Economic Sciences Division there and we are grateful to the, for their investment it demonstrates that each of these organizations is interested in ensuring that their investments in research data uh, are have positive returns. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Our team, uh, it takes a village to do this project. And you'll see UMSI is the University of Michigan School of Information. Uh, and so some of our team members are over in SI and many are in uh, ICPSR. And we, work together in sort of four phases on the project, but any of these folks would be happy to talk to you about the work. <clears throat> 
our main questions are, what impacts do specific curatorial actions have on research data's impact or reuse? And how should we prioritize curatorial actions to achieve impact and return on investment? So uh, if anyone is familiar with curation, I think Rajuda is on. So Rajuda can't answer because she knows all the things about curation. But anybody else, what might be a curatorial action? You can throw it in chat or Q&A. And I'll stop for just a second. Yes, so an important update from Lynette, we now have over 91,000 citations. So my slide is a little outdated there. Um, yes, removing direct identifiers. So these are ways in which you could identify an individual from an aggregated data set or creating a code book. This is where you describe what variables mean or what, what they represent. Over in Q&A, Lori says assigning metadata. Absolutely, that these are all different types of curatorial actions. What are first question is is that we want to understand what is the direct if there is a direct relationship between any of those actions so if you assign metadata to a study does it have an impact on whether or not that study gets reused um, and metadata is pretty broad but um, something like a code book or an identifier sort of if you remove direct identifiers does it change whether or not the study is reusable is an is part of that um, and then the second question then tells us, once we understand the relationship between a particular action and its impact on use, then we can know, given uh, limited resources, where should we make sure that we spend them? So is it absolutely necessary, for instance, that we include question text for every survey? That's a common one that comes up, that without the question text, many of the variables in a survey would be um, it'd be really hard to understand what they were representing. Uh, and so that's often where we put resources into making sure that we attach question text. And then as Lori mentioned, assigning metadata is important. We want to know if there's only so much metadata available to you, how do you prioritize which ones you describe? Or if you're waiting for a primary investigator to reply um, to a question about metadata, are there, is it possible to get some impact by using what's available to you uh, already, like if it's in a series and you're able to attach metadata from a prior study, these sorts of questions. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at in the MICA project so that we know, um, you know, there are limited resources for preparing and preserving data. Um, and we wanna make sure that we use them effectively uh, and responsibly. Oh, there we go. So our main activities, as I mentioned, we have phases. The first phase is to understand the values, priorities, and what curatorial actions there are. Uh, and the UMSI team, led by Beth Yackel and Andrea Thomer, is conducting semi-structured interviews. Allison Tyler is a PhD student who's been doing those with uh, staff at ICPSR and investigators who use our data to try to understand when someone deposits data at an archive like ICPSR, what kind of impact are they looking for? How would they measure whether or not that was a good investment for them. And then uh, my team at ICPSR is doing content analysis and uh, Mike asked a question in the Q&A about whether we use um, artificial intelligence, at least I hope that's what you mean by AI, that's how I interpreted it. Um, artificial intelligence to tag the studies, we don't right now, but we are trying to use artificial intelligence to uh, parse the curatorial actions. And what we found over the summer is that, well, I'm skipping ahead, but we'll talk a little bit about what machine learning was able to not tell us over the summer. The second phase will be measuring reuse and impact. So if you think of this as a regression analysis, the um, values, priorities, and curatorial actions will be on the right side. So this is the stuff that we can measure about the, um, the study itself. And then whether or not it has impact is the left side. So, um, are we able to predict how often something will get reused or predict some other measure of impact that we generated based on uh, what people tell us about what they what kind of impact they want to have or how they would measure it. Um, and so we're using multivariate regression and structural equation modeling um, to assess those relationships. And then once we understand what those relationships are, we can do the third phase, which is 
uh, generating curatorial metrics. So again, here we're trying to use some path analysis or those structural equation models to say, if you do um, attach question text and you make sure that metadata is complete, then you're gonna get twice as many downloads of your study. And so then that tells us the sort of 2X is the curatorial metric for question text and complete metadata. Um, and those metrics are ways to measure what's the impact of your investment in this piece. So if you appropriately tag geography, which is often something that comes up, um, if you provide geography or geographic constraints on the data, does it then get reused more often? So you know it's worth investing in good metadata about geography. That's what we mean when we're saying we want to measure the relationships between the curatorial action and its impact and then be able to use a metric or a consistent measure. So how do we understand curatorial action? So as I said, my part of it, I lead the team that looks at the curatorial action side right now. This text is, maybe you can read it a little better sitting at your desk, but the, um, the goal here isn't necessarily for you to be able to read every part of this, but to see that this is a, um, so there's a lot of text. And as Mike mentioned in my introduction, I study um, social media, and that means that I'm used to working with text as data. And so I come to this curatorial actions project as a person who's used to using text as data, and I use computational approaches to reading lots and lots of text, like I'm running something on 16 million tweets right now, um, where I see the processing history files as text data that I can then parse automatically to see what kinds of actions get taken. So this is an SPSS file that is a processing history file that tells us what did a curator at ICPSR do to the Caribbean migrations to make a return migrant study when they processed the study. Uh, and so you can tell, so then my team parses this computationally rather than reading it with our eyeballs we read it with computers uh, and see if there are particular actions that get taken um, repeatedly so for instance the original count and final count tell us that one variable was removed that suggests either that the variable was empty or that it was disclosure risk review or there might be some other reason that it was taken out and later in the file, I don't have the complete file on the screen, later in the file we would see some syntax about how a variable um, was removed. There's also a comment about merging with weights um, and we're using right now an unsupervised model which means we ask the it, unsupervised machine learning is like a sort of factor analysis where you throw all the data at the computer and the computer tells you what patterns it finds. Um, and so it would tell us that it sees the term weights often. Um, and usually in, in what we've looked at so far, it tells us that there's a weighting variable um, that gets added at the, to each uh, observation. Um, and if you don't communicate about weights, then Lynette can tell us all sorts of horror stories about the inferences that you would make if you don't appropriately weight your responses. Um, and so these are the types of things that show up in a processing history file. And so we read these computationally to see what actions emerge uh, and show up as repeated um, in processing history. The second set of text is data that we use are JIRA ticket annotations. So the ICPSR curation team uses JIRA, which I'm familiar with as a software developer, but we're using it across other units now too, um, to keep track of what people have done to particular data. So for here, um, for instance, you could see it says curation ph file still working on masking geographic string variables. So this tells us that a curator was working on a processing history file and what work was that person doing? They were masking geography. So when we read this computationally, we get ph file or ph file work shows up often, which tells us that they're working on processing history. And then we parse what comes after that. So we have still working on masking string variables, um, masked for restricted data sets, duplicate variables. These things tell us that curators are often 
masking variables, fixing duplicates, labeling, designating, missing, all of those phrases appear more often in this text than they do in other texts. And that tells us that it's, it's likely related to curation. Um, <clears throat> and so we tried to point, a, un, again, an unsupervised model at these JIRA tickets to see if particular words like missing or variable labels emerged. Um, unfortunately, over the summer, we ran this part of the study where we were trying to automatically read JIRA tickets. And the language is generic enough that our first attempts at the model were not useful and that now we are back to trying to read them by hand. Well, I guess you don't read by hand, you read manually um, or automatically. So we're trying to read them manually to see if we can build a supervised model where we would label a bunch of JIRA tickets with curatorial actions that we as experts in curation recognize. And then we would try to teach the machine algorithm um, to recognize those actions on its own. So we train, you know, 10% of the sample or 10% of the JIRA tickets or something, and then the computer would label the other 90%. That's our next step um, to see if we're able to teach it that way, since we weren't we were not successful using an unsupervised model. It didn't find interesting patterns on its own. Um, and then that's both of those. So the reading the processing history files and reading the JIRA tickets tells us something about what actions are taken. Um, on the other side of the equation are measuring reuse. So once we're able to identify those curatorial actions, we want to know how they're related to some measure of use. Two measures of use and reuse and impact that we're interested in. One is secondary impact, which is how many times that study, uh, oh, I moved it that reuse a particular data set are cited. Um, so primary impact is like how often is the data set itself cited? Secondary impact would be if a, another study, another paper used that data and then it got cited. So it's the second level. Um, another measure of reuse and impact uh, is diversity, which is the breadth of dif disciplines that use the data. So if it's used often, but only by political scientists, then it may have high secondary impact and low diversity. Uh, if it's used only a few times, but it's used by a biologist and a political scientist and a sociologist, then it would have low secondary impact and high diversity. So these are sort of measuring different aspects of reuse or different kinds of impact. Um, and the idea is that different researchers are interested in having different kinds of impact and different funders are interested in having different kinds of impact. And so we want to understand whether there are particular curation steps that we can take that increase the likelihood that something has secondary impact or increase the likelihood that it would achieve diversity uh, if those are so that funders and researchers can know um, how best to meet their reuse and impact goals. What we know is that the bibliography, which I mentioned earlier, is one of my favorite things about ICPSR, and Lynette told me I should update to over 91,000 citations. The, we know that the bibliography is a low end estimate of all of the publications that have resulted from analysis of data in our collections. That there are a bunch of different ways in which folks don't quite cite the data. Um, one is that it's almost complete, meaning that the data are formally cited with the references, but the DOI isn't included. So it's not, well, it's possible, but hard to automatically detect those citations, where a complete citation would include the DOI. Another way that people almost cite the data uh, is indirectly, that the data are referred to by name. Um, so for instance, the National Election Survey might be referred to by name, but it's not cited in the reference list. Uh, and those are, our bibliography is currently assembled by hand. So there are staff at ICPSR whose job it is to attach bibliography items to studies. And the 
reality is that our collection is too big and research is too fast for them to be able to collect every single paper that gets written about a study. And so this is another place where we're hoping to use uh, machine learning to try to help us automate some of the analysis. So um, Sarah Lafia, who I, who I mentioned as a team member, she actually starts on Monday. So she has two more business days. Um, she is gonna help us figure out whether it's possible for us to teach machines to detect these almost citations. So can we tell when data should have been cited, but either wasn't formally um, or was almost, but not quite completely cited so that we can capture more of the publications that rely on uh, data that's in our collection so that we can make our bibliography more complete so that we can measure secondary impact and diversity. Um, so we need to be able to expand the bibliography before we have better measures of secondary impact and diversity. If we use our current bibliography, we'll have good measures, but they'll all be low end estimates. Uh, and so we'd like to be able to capture more of the bibliography and more types of papers or presentations that use data in our collection. Uh, and I mentioned that we were looking for metrics. So this is a one representation of the structural equation model that we might be using. So there are particular measures of reuse. Um, so we have diversity and secondary count, primary count, page views, downloads, the number of users, et cetera. Um, and then there are properties of ICPSR, like was it available for online analysis or did people have, was it restricted access? Um, how much of the bibliography, how much was available in the bibliography? Properties of the data set, properties of the metadata, uh, and then the curation steps. So we have some uh, control variables that we want to include in the ICPSR, the data set, and metadata as well. Um, and then we're really interested in those top two reuse and curation and their relationship. And our hope is that we'll get labels and values for as many of these connections as we can in the next two and a half years. We've been working really, I mean, it, time is meaningless kind of during COVID, but we've been at it for about a year um, right now. And we ran a pilot that looked just at downloads. So one measure of reuse and trying to understand what might impact uh, how often a particular study gets downloaded. Excuse me, just a So we looked at the year of the release, the number of studies that were released that year in this frequency table. You can see um, we don't have consistent numbers of studies that get released every year. And so we want to make sure that we're controlling a little bit for time. Uh, and then we ran regression to see if anything about the study or about curation activities um, impacted how often something got downloaded. So here, series means, was it part of a series? Like the American National Election Survey is a series. Uh, how many variables it had, whether or not it was a single primary investigator study. So those are all properties of the study itself. And then curation activity, where sponsored is, was someone paying for this to be curated or was it a project of the ICPSR membership? Um, intense curation is sort of a catch-all for, yes, it went through our um, more, it got more attention from the curators. Um, and then N metadata terms is sort of how many search terms were attached to the study. And what we find is that being part of a series and having a single PI are negatively related with downloads. So they get downloaded less uh, and all other variables are correlated with more downloads. So if it has a sponsor, if it, it went through intense curation, which likely means that it has more complete metadata and question text, um, and if it has more metadata terms, meaning people can find it using lots of different searches, um, and that if it has many variables, then people are more likely to download it. And this was sort of a, I call it a pilot because we were trying to understand, could we do this study at all? And then um, we would try to get more specific about what intent curation means and what metadata terms mean um, and other types of the study properties. 
and I present the three different models here because we looked first at just series because we were curious about whether or not being part of a series had any impact. Um, and then we modeled properties of the study and then we included properties of curation and model three was the best performing. And so that's why I include it at the end is like, yes, when we account for curation, um, we get a better understanding of why downloads might occur. So there's something about curation that matters uh, related to sponsorship and the intensity of curation, meaning how much work went into it and the number of metadata terms attached so that people can find it. Our predictions were that curation activity will increase the downloads and that, as I just mentioned, said yes. Um, then we were curious about which curation activities have the most impact. And so these are the highest coefficients. So they're sponsorship and intense curation. Um, we assumed that bigger studies, so those with more variables, would receive more downloads. We predicted that because it's the number of variables sort of indicates the breadth of information collected. So there might be more analytic utility if there are more variables. Uh, and then we also assumed or predicted that series would receive more downloads in part because uh, series become series because they are important to folks. And that prediction was not supported. And one thing that we're looking into is whether the citations for a series change when a new version of the series comes out. So for instance, if the 2016 version of a survey gets a lot of citations and then the 2017 version of the survey comes out, do people stop citing 2016 um, and they're looking at 2017, which would indicate that many series analyses are point in time rather than longitudinal analysis. So that we're going to be looking uh, more into what the relationship is between being part of a series um, and download and use might be. Um, and now my pitch for you as part of the summer program, especially, is what does this mean for data depositors? So we found, we'll go back. So curation matters is the main takeaway. Oh, I don't know what that was. Um, oh, it was a link. Okay. Uh, sponsorship. So having somebody who cares about your data besides you um, and besides, in addition to the membership matters and intense curation, meaning there's something about what ICPSR is doing in the curation unit that matters. That's part of what we're trying to figure out. And then um, having more variables, so capturing more information. Those are all things that lead to increased downloads, which is just one measure of reuse. And for data depositors, that means that curation, especially metadata terms and well-documented variables, increases reuse. So if you're interested in ways to better document your variables and what we mean by metadata terms and how to fill them out, we have a new sixth edition guide to social science data preparation and archiving. Um, in my slides, this is a link that'll take you there. Uh, that it's a PDF and it has a bunch of information about how to properly describe your variables so that people can understand what they are, which is what um, Lynette mentioned when talking about creating a codebook. And it also outlines the metadata that we collect and use through um, DDI, which as Lori mentioned in the Q&A, um, metadata is an important part of curation and especially because we see that it correlates with downloads. And part of why we started with downloads as a measure is that people can't reuse your data if they don't download it. So that's sort of a, the biggest way that we could, the broadest way that we could measure reuse. Um, and it's a sort of necessary precursor to any other types of use. Um, and Lynette asked, when you count downloads, are you counting only when the data are downloaded or documentation, documentation by itself? In this pilot, it's the data files. So ICPSR counts when you download documentation about a data set and when you download a data set and when you use a data set online. And in this case, we were looking at whether or not somebody downloaded a data set file. So that's like an SPSS file or um, a plain text file with data in it. So again, thank you for your time. I'm ready for questions in just a second, but I wanna remind you our main goal is to develop these measures that help us evaluate the impact of specific data curation activities so that we know where to spend our resources. And we are supported by IMLS and the National Science Foundation. And if you have questions that I don't answer tonight, I would love to hear from you. 
um, through email or on Twitter at Libby H. Thanks. I think I did the other end. Um, Mike from Q and A, if you're still here, can you tell me a little more about uh, what you mean by using AI to tag it? So, as a machine learning person, I'm always interested in applications of our systems, and I wonder um, what kinds of tags you're thinking about. They can't talk, but they can put it in Q and A, right? He could he could put it either in Q and A or in the chat. Oh, okay. But yes, thank you, Naomi, for reminding me that I still don't know how Zoom works. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, so in the Q and A, it says the thyroid tagging not setting the curation benefit. Um, I think that we're interested in whether there are particular types of metadata that we can attach automatically. So we have a project that we sometimes refer to as Turbo Curator, uh, which is an interactive AI system that we have imagined and started to design at ICPSR. It's one of Maggie Levenstein's projects to see if we can guide primary investigators through the preparation of metadata. Um, so I think that would be, it's an AI system, but it's human in the loop um, so that the curation wouldn't happen automatically but the process of curating or generate or sort of getting information from primary investigators about the data would be automated at least partially. Uh, so stay tuned. That turbo curator is um, hopefully in the pipeline in the next few years at ICPSR. Thank you, Lori, for your comments, participating. It made me feel like I'm not quite alone or speaking into a void. Okay, so Mike's question is, if a third party can curate data from a study into a curation site, or does the study author have to agree and store the data? Um, I'm not quite sure if I understand your question, but I will give it a shot. So uh, I'll use Open ICPSR as an example. Uh, so in Open ICPSR, the data is not touched by our curation team, but it may have been curated, and I'm using quotes not to dismiss, but because it's a different type of curation, where the investigator who deposits at, at, ICP, at Open ICPSR may have done some of the data preparation themselves. Um, or we have, there's a user who sometimes updates uh, administrative data. So it's data that's been pub provided publicly and then they attach additional metadata and then deposit it open ICPSR. So it is possible for other folks to do some of the curatorial work. Um, and that when we're looking at curation in the micro project, we're interested, especially at what happens at ICPSR, but really any attempt to prepare data for reuse or attach metadata, et cetera, would be interesting to us because we, it's, we're not only looking at whether or not ICPSR curation matters, but does which parts of data preparation matter, no matter who does them. Um, and so right now, the only third party curation space is in open ICPSR, um, but I think we're also looking at ways for people to contribute metadata to studies. So I think, again, Maggie and Yan Chen in the School of Information 
have um, an experiment about metadata and the attachment of metadata by third parties that's running now to see whether other users like uh, data librarians or people who have used the data downstream might be able to attach um, metadata or other descriptors that are useful um, for de uh, describing particular studies. Does that get sort of at what you're asking, Mike? Okay, great, thank you. Let's see, have you thought about a way that these curation measures might help a user to select which data to use in comparison to two or three alternative data sets? Um, so yes, I love all these questions about the pipeline because it allows me to talk about other projects that are happening um, at ICPSR. So right now, AJ Million, who is the director of NACJD, the um, Criminal Justice Archive, and I and Sarah Lafia are working on a proposal about data set recommender systems. So is it possible for us to use shared metadata, for instance, to recommend a particular data set to someone? So if you come in and you're interested in data set A, we can say, hey, data set B actually has intersecting variables, but additional variables that might be of interest to you. So you might wanna check out data set B as well. Um, and the more that we know about what types of curation occur, the more we know about how data sets might be related that would allow us to make better predictions about what data set may be of interest to a user um, who has started with a particular data set. If you have other ideas for how we might use measures to help people pick between data sets they already know about, I would love to hear them. Whether it's like a completeness thing or a question text or a particular variable, um, how people decide between alternative data sets would be useful. Oh, I can also plug another project. Jeremy York is a PhD student at the School of Information who is studying uh, how folks decide whether or not a data set is of use to them. And so we're hoping that outcomes from Jeremy's dissertation will help us understand which information about a data set do potential reusers use to decide whether or not to reuse. That was a lot of different reuses. Um, but Jeremy's study is running right now. So hopefully some of Jeremy's findings plus our understandings of curatorial actions will help us help users find the right data faster. You know, from, from the outside, Libby, mm -hmm. a user, you know, might have a primary interest in the variables that are available, you know, the substance, uh -huh. uh, or, or maybe the relevance of the sample, the units of analysis. But, wow, okay. but they could get to a point where they have um, two or three data sets that are in their own mind sort of equivalent, but one of them might be potentially easier to use than the other based upon the quality of the, or the state oh, sure. or stage of the curation. So that could, yeah. that, that could provide a sort of important second level indication of uh, which one to select or how, or how to think about a preference of one over another. I was disappearing to grab my pen because I'm going to write that down. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I also, um, when you first started talking, I was thinking about, oh, we also are working on ways to expand the metadata that we keep about studies so that we can do things like help people find which data sets have um, sample sizes of marginalized populations that are large enough to let them do comparative analyses. Uh, so yeah, these would be, um, yeah, this is, thanks Mike, that's a good idea. Uh, so I mean, you could think about, you could think about the audience uh, as, uh, or, you know, the clientele, as uh, composed of different types of people with different interests. 
Mm -hmm. so, so you take the you think about the graduate student who's working on dissertation project and they have a you know a finite time perspective so ease of access and ability to move along in the analysis might be a higher uh, criterion priority for them right. than say a more experienced uh, researcher with a more sophisticated sense of either measurement or the need for subgroup analysis. Mm -hmm. Sure. Or we're thinking often, one of our most common users is an undergraduate in their first statistics class that sort of understanding which of these data sets is going to let you get to your stats assignment quicker might also be useful. So not just researchers as sort of investigators or graduate students, but researchers who are new to data analysis, maybe we can keep them in a fold a little longer if we point them towards well-documented, easy to use data sets. Yeah, term, a, a term project would be different than a dissertation, than different than a, a pilot study for an NIH grant. Right, yeah. So I see two questions about uh, stats packages, one from Jenna in the Q&A and one from Lynette in the chat. And um, whether, so when data comes into ICPSR, we often chain, uh, what would I call this? We transform it maybe uh, to SPSS. Most of our, many of our systems use, our internal systems use SPSS um, and I would also love to convince PIs to use open source formats because I'm an R and Python person myself. So I, I am often frustrated by proprietary formats. Um, but to answer your question and Lynette's, we haven't looked yet at whether the type of file that is deposited matters or the type of file that's downloaded. So one of the things that we do when in curation at the last stage is to produce files of many different formats so that you can, even if I as a depositor provide the study in say an RDA file or something, um, which is a, an R data format, that it's available to users in SPSS, Stata, and CSV as well. So one of the things that we do um, in curation is to prepare different file formats um, but no, we haven't yet looked at those, but they are definitely something that we're interested in. Um, especially because I would love to say, look, we just need to keep providing plain text. Because that makes my life easier. But one thing the data might tell us is that I'm alone and that really it's easier for everybody if we provide it in SPSS or Stata. We have time for uh, a couple of additional questions. Yeah, see, Lynette is telling me, yes, SPSS is still the most common format. Again, I think this is because the undergrads in their stats classes are doing the downloading. Um, and that's fine, I wanna support them. Of course, I want more people with data analysis and skills and data literacy, um, but I can keep hoping for plain text. In your analyses, do you have a variable that is like uh, an index of the number of formats available or? So right now we have dummy variables for each format, but we could easily construct one that's like total packages available in. So we have a set of binary variables that are, is it available in SPSS, is it available in Stata, whatever. Um, which for most of our data sets, it's available in all of them. And what we don't have yet is the download number per file type. Um, but we will include it. One of the many benefits of doing this study at ICPSR is that we have access to so much data on the back end about what gets downloaded and what went into the preparation of a file that it really is a tremendous opportunity to look at the whole life cycle from deposit to use. 
Well, um, I think we might have reached the limit of the uh, questions from the audience, but I want to remind the audience and people who will see the recording of the presentation that Libby has left her email uh, at the end of her slide deck. Mm -hmm. And if other questions come to mind, uh, you should feel free to contact Libby with ideas about uh, measures that could be added to her study or different uh, analyses that could be conducted with the kinds of information that she's already collecting. But uh, I want to thank you, uh, Libby, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, and it's a, a fitting culmination to our, our, our series, our little mini series on data stewardship and uh, curation. And I want to thank the members of the audience who are present here in Zoom uh, for tuning in tonight uh, for, the, for the final Blaylock lecture in the 2020 summer program series. But remind you that you can see uh, any of the previous uh, presentations that were recorded on the summer program YouTube uh, channel. Thanks again for signing in and uh, for most of you are summer program participants. Thanks for joining us in the summer program this year. Uh, we hope that we'll see uh, some of you, many of you uh, in next summer's program. Thanks again and good night.